Spiegel, and I teach English here at Columbia, and I'm the co-editor of Literature and Medicine. And I want to welcome everyone to the afternoon session on memory, the body, and the self. Professor James Olney established, virtually created himself, the field of the study and theory of autobiography. He is the author of Metaphors of Self, The Meaning of Autobiography, and Memory and Narrative, The Weave of Life Writing, among many other titles. And among his many contributions, he is professor of English at Louis Louisiana State University and co-editor of the Southern Review. Our respondent, Professor Stephen Marcus, is the George Delacourt Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia and a very beloved professor here. He is a renowned Victorianist, author of the now classic The Other Victorians, among many other titles. He has for years done groundbreaking work in interdisciplinary studies. Most recently, and for over a decade now, he's been teaching a colloquium at Columbia College in medicine in Western civilization with historian David Rothman. Uh, here's Professor Olney. Thank you very much. Uh, I should say before I begin how pleased I am to be here today and what a splendid job uh, Rita Sharon has done in bringing uh, all this together and all of us together. I think it's been uh, an incredible feat. Um, I worried a little bit this morning as I listened to the uh, presentations that I might not have anything new to say because uh, there were so many of the subjects that I intended to address touched on. Uh, or more than touched on, actually explored quite fully. Uh, but then I decided it was all right because um, I'm coming from quite a different angle. I mean, I have nothing to do with medicine uh, except for uh, being more and more frequently these days a patient uh, of uh, medicine. Um, and I think that uh, to come from a quite a different angle and yet be saying uh, things on the same subjects might be uh, worthwhile. Um, I want to um, forewarn you about one feature of my pa paper. I want to forewarn you so that you won't be su so as surprised by this feature of the paper as I was uh, when I wrote it. You're not hearing? I'm sorry. Um, I want you to be not as surprised by this feature of the paper as I was when I was writing the paper. Uh, and that is that I, um, halfway through the, or l less than halfway through the paper, I suddenly realized that almost everything I wanted to say about autobiography uh, could be said with reference to a single text. Uh, this is uh, Vladimir Nabokov's Speak Memory. Uh, and I had not imagined, I had not thought I was going to be dealing with uh, Nabokov at all. Uh, I have never in the past written about Nabokov. Uh, and though I do sometimes include him in seminars on autobiography, uh, he, in the beginning, was for me a figure that I felt uncomfortable with. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why I did. I'm going to uh, briefly address that question in the course of the uh, paper, but uh, I, for a long time, had a very uh, distant and hands-off uh, attitude uh, towards uh, Nabokov, and yet I think that uh, he serves me very well in what I want to say, but I'll let you be the judge of whether uh, I was right in the past or whether I'm uh, right now. Excuse me, I want to get this right so I can see <laughs> what I'm reading. Um, now, I, I hope that everybody got a copy of the handout, uh, which contains a poem by Elizabeth um, Bishop and also two passages from Nabokov that I want to uh, read in the course of the paper. But I, uh, I do very much want to have the text in front of you uh, when we come to those passages. The title of my paper is Life and the Memory of It. When I began to think about what I might say today on the subject of autobiography and narrative medicine, I was reminded of a cartoon clip from some journal or other that I received some years ago. The occasion was my preparing to direct an any summer seminar for college teachers. This particular one was called The Forms of Autobiography. And the clipping came from one of the teachers chosen to participate in the seminar. It shows two men, one self-assured and jaunty, the other dejected and quite unprepossessing in, in appearance, sitting in what is evidently a publishing office. Speaking from behind an imposing desk, the first man says, I'm sorry, we can't publish your autobiography. To which the other responds, well, that's the story of my life. <laughs> uh, 
It's interesting and perhaps understandable that the sad little man should feel that rejection of his autobiography, the story of his life, is very nearly the same as rejection of his life. It's a little like the psychiatrist who tells a patient who claims to suffer from an inferiority complex, you don't have an inferiority complex, you are inferior. <laughs> well, that's the story of my life. What the poor man was attempting was what so many, and especially in recent years, have compelled, felt compelled to do, to half discover, half create that story unique to each individual and to tell it to some portion of the world in an effort to find a meaning for it all. What I want to suggest today is that autobiography, as, or as I sometimes prefer to call it, life writing, presents itself as the most pertinent literary form to be considered at a conference on narrative medicine. I don't propose to say how life writing might be used by medical practitioners, whether physicians or ethicists, because I'm not qualified to do so. Instead, I want to reflect on the inner nature of the act of writing the story of one's life, what it means to do that, and I hope that there may emerge from what I have to say some sense of the relevance of life writing for the practice of medicine. I'll present this case for the centrality of life writing to narrative medicine under three general interrelated notions. First, that life writing is a profoundly narrative act uh, that offers itself for and demands interpretation. Second, that in autobiography we get the life of the author, the feel, the manner, the essence, the style, more directly, more fully than in any other mode. And third, that the principal, if not the sole resource of the autobiography is memory, and this determines its supreme importance in thinking about narrative and its uses. But before I turn to these three points, I want to reflect, reflect, reflect briefly on what I take to be a curious fact that autobiography has been generally absent from the documents I'm familiar with in the literature of narrative medicine. Admittedly, I've not read as deeply as I should have in this growing literature, but I have nibbled around the edges, and it has surprised me to find so little reference, indeed, I don't recall any, to autobiography as a possibly crucial act of writing for those sketching out this new turn in thought about medical practice. In Rita Sharon's writing, I have encountered Henry James on occasion, but always as a novelist, not, a, not as an autobiographer, though he was that too, and at some length. And nowhere have I come across St. Augustine, or Montaigne, or Jean-Jacques Rousseau, or, or John Stuart Mill, or Gertrude Stein, or, Virtu or Virginia Woolf, or Vladimir Nabokov, or any of the others I would take to be the classics of the form. I've pondered why this should be so, and wonder, wonder whether it might not be for the same reason that literary critics disdain for so long to admit autobiography as a legitimate or pertinent or useful area for studying their discipline. There's been a flood of books, flood of books on autobiography as a literary act in the last few years, but as recently as about 35 years ago, and that's no time at all in terms of uh, literary history, as recently as about 35 years ago, no critic seemed willing to touch this writing there was deemed to be no more and no better than an illegitimate spawn of history. Of course, historians, for their part, were not about to acknowledge this brat as theirs either, and so not imaginative enough for the literary critic and not factual enough for the historian, this poor waif was left by everybody to shiver out in the cold alone. <laughs> as I've said, this is no longer true for the literary critic, but it is my suspicion that when people first began to give thought to what literature could offer to narrative medicine, they wanted not a stepchild of literature, but as it were, the full Monty. I hope to make the case that autobiography is a fully creative, imaginative act, the equal of poetry, the novel, and drama, and that it has virtues and strengths peculiar to itself that should be of particular value to practitioners and theorists of narrative medicine. But before I leave this issue, issue I'll glance at two different, as I take it mistaken, attempts to categorize autobiography. And the first is the Dewey Decimal System of Classification, which posits autobiography as a subcategory of biography, which is itself a subcategory of history. This seems to me a simple category error. At times I've entertained the notion, perhaps not very seriously, that one could simply stand the matter on its head and make the writing of history and biography a function of the writer's autobiography. But librarians need some systematic order 
So I won't bother further, uh, and I won't bother historians further about this. The other faulty definition, no doubt a more interesting one, occurs in that great compendium of universal knowledge, the Encyclopedia Britannica, as recently as 1980. If you look up autobiography in the Britannica, you'll be directed to see biographical writing. And if you do as you are bid, you will find this as a kind of afterthought to the main entry. Autobiography is a very close relative or special form of biographical literature. It is the life of a man that happens to have been written by himself and is therefore unfinished. <laughs> Let me pause just a moment over this. I've already denied that autobiography is a subcategory of biography and so will only remark that the fact that biography depends primarily on documents for its source material, while autobiography depends on memory, alters entirely the terms of the act of writing and distinguishes the, distinguishes the one decisively from the other. But consider now the actual definition offered. It is the life, I deny that, of a man, I deny the necessity of that, that happens, happens, <laughs> happens to, to have been written by himself. Is that fact so inconsequential? <laughs> happens to, and is therefore unfinished. And is therefore unfinished. Try telling that to Nabokov about speak memory, which is as finished as any novel and a lot more finished than most. Of course, Nabokov's life was not finished with the end of speak memory. But as a narrative act and a work of art, the book is as finished as it could conceivably be. The confusion begins with the claim, and I'll just mention parenthetically that the uh, encyclopedia entry was written by a male biographer, a male biographer. Uh, the confusion begins with the claim that an autobiography is the life of a man. It is not, it's the story of a life. It's a narrative and that makes all the difference. If we agree then that life writing is or may be a literary mode as imaginative as, as any other, let's examine what this tells us about the writing of autobiography, thank you, and even more to the point about the reading of autobiography. Whatever may be the immediate motive for constructing and recounting a life story, I believe that anyone who undertakes the task with any seriousness at all ultimately seeks to discover or to create, and I will suggest in a moment that these are merely two ways of viewing a single process, a meaning a meaning for the experiences of a life. What does it mean to have lived this life? Is always and ever the autobiographer's essential question. And turning the affair around to its other face, from the writing of autobiography to the reading of it, I would say that the serious and attentive reader of life writing commits in a collaborative gesture to this same pursuit of meaning, at first the meaning of the autobiographer's experience, but then by the mysterious ways of art, the meaning of the reader's own experience. There are two features of this joint, joint engagement in pursuit of meaning that need emphasizing. The first is that meaning is not to be sought or found in raw experience. What Lillian Smith, uh, contemplating the audacious act of autobiography, calls the 10 billion acts and thoughts and feelings of anyone's life, or in what Virginia Woolf terms the cotton wall of daily existence but appertains only to the patterning or ordering of experience, which in life writing is nearly always, one way or another, a narrative pattern. The second is that as readers joined with the writer in search of meaning, we are involved in, mo in a most complex act of interpretation in terms of a text and other life and our own lives. We write, Lillian Smith says, and I would act add that we read, because of an urgent necessity to create out of our 10 billion acts and thoughts and feelings a story of our life that is essentially true and meaningful. It is a great and daring creative act, this giving meaning to what might be only amorphous and absurd were we not to seek the intense and profound awareness that transforms as it creates the story we set down. The meaningless ashes William Smith says, the meaningless ashes are brought to life by the phoenix of awareness. Though life writing might seem to be a matter of a close relationship only between an author and a life, I believe that by its very nature, autobiography always imagines publication, like the man in my opening anecdote, and asks for a reader. And it is in this three-cornered complex of author, life story, reader, 
that autobiography assumes its fullest theoretical and hermeneutical or interpretative value for narrative medicine. As I've already said, I don't want to venture into territory where I'm not qualified to speak, but I do think there can be something very suggestive about parallels between the author, life story, reader trio on the one hand, and the patient, life story, physician trio on the other. Having introduced the term hermeneutical, I'll go off on a slight tangent to explore some of the principles of interpretation, and in particular, what certain philosophers term the hermeneutical circle. This notion came first from the field of biblical exegesis and could be expressed in the form of the paradox that we must understand in order to believe, or we must believe in order to understand. Later versions of this paradox would assert that we can understand a text only from a basis of previous self-understanding, but our self-understanding, at least in the context of our reading, is contingent upon the understanding we have of the meaning created in the text. And again, that we can understand a whole, whether it be a whole text or a whole life, only by understanding first the parts, but we can understand any part or parts only by understanding first the whole. Philosophers of the hermeneutical circle deny that theirs is a vicious circle because they allow, if not for a break in the circle, then for an infinite incremental expansion of it in, to bring in more and more of belief and understanding or of self-understanding and text understanding from the contraries of the paradox. Hans Georg Gadamer, one of the major proponents of philosophical hermeneutics, speaks of the interpretation of texts, for example, the text of an autobiography as a dialogue. But a text can begin to speak, he writes, when it does begin to speak, it does not simply speak its word always the same in lifeless rigidity, but gives ever new answers to the person who questions it and poses ever new questions to him who answers it. To understand a text is to come to understand oneself in a kind of dialogue. But Gadamer has already established that the making of a text, the discovery of words to express an ever new sense of what one would say and what one is, that is to express an ever new self-understanding, is precisely parallel dialogical process, is a precisely parallel dialogical process. So we have a dialogue promoting self-understanding through text understanding going on on both sides of the text, the author's side, the reader's side. If we transpose this to the doctor-patient relationship, we get a doubling of the hermeneutical circle in which a complex dance of self-understanding on the one hand and of life story understanding on the other is going on from both sides, for ideally, the physician does not leave his or her story at home when coming into the clinic any more than the patient does. At least this is what I understand to be one of the founding principles of narrative medicine, if not perhaps of other medical philosophies. What can we say of the pattern that implies a meaning which is so assiduously sought by the writer and reader of autobiography alike? I have remarked that for the life writer, the pattern is nearly always narrative in form. There may be, as one theologically inclined observer has claimed, an incipient narrative structure to experience itself. But surely it is the case that when someone comes to reflect back over the course of a life from the standpoint of the present, hoping to find some kind of coherence, some pattern, and some meaning, then such structure as emerges must come not from unmediated experience, but from the interplay between the brooding consciousness of the present moment on the one hand and those events seeking form, explanation, and meaning on the other. I think that one might agree that there is or may be, as Wordsworth says, an exquisite fit between the human mind and the world which allows us to discover and assert a pattern, but what must be insisted upon is the process of that fitting. It is not an a priori or a given of experience. Therefore, Wordsworth writes in Tinner and Abbey, am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains and of all that we behold from this green earth, of all the mighty world, of eye and ear, both what they have to create and what perceive. And he goes on with this remarkable and important extension of the thought. Well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, 
the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being. This addition I call important because what I understand Wordsworth to say is that this congruence of human and natural things, this perception of shared pattern and meaning, while it may eventually, uh, while it may be eventually transmitted to the mind, is first received in the body, and is, it is remembered there for the body and its senses possess memory as surely as the mind does. And this, I take it, is an important tenet for narrative medicine. I witness with pleasure, Nabokov writes and speak memory, the supreme achievement of memory, which is the masterly use it makes of innate harmonies when gathering to its fold the suspended and wandering tonalities of the past. Harmonies innate on the one hand and memory with its supreme ordering powers on the other. This is as Nabokovian as it is Wordsworthian and of crucial consequence for anyone thinking about how life writing might achieve a sense of pattern and meaning for both author and reader. Elsewhere, in a piece called Paris Poem, Nabokov writes of what I take, I take it he would think to be the autobiographer's ultimate desire. In this life, rich in patterns, a life unrepeatable since with a different cast, in a different manner, in a new theater will be given, no better joy would I choose than to fold its magnificent carpet in such a fashion as to make the design of today coincide with the past, with the former pattern, in order to visit again. Here he breaks off, Nabokov breaks off to say it's not the long lost Russia he wants to revisit. And he goes on, but by finding congruences with the remote to revisit my fountainhead, to bend and discover in my own childhood the end of the tangled up thread. Life may be rich in innate patterns, but it is up to the autobiographical artist to draw them out and see them repeated through a life, throughout a life and from generation to generation. It is the artistry which lies on both sides of the reader-writer equation that Nabokov everywhere emphasizes. There are two passages in Speak Memory, which you have on that handout. Uh, there are two passages in Speak Memory. Well, there are many more, but I want to emphasize just two that are particularly luminous with respect to the author-reader work of art triangle, where the past, present, and future are all folded together and the tenses of time disappear into the changeless work of art. The first is a memory of, this is a quote, the dreamy flow of punts and canoes on the Cam River during the time Nabokov spent at Cambridge. The pink coned chestnuts were in full fan. They made overlapping masses along the banks. They crowded the sky out of the river and their special pattern of flowers and leaves produced a kind of on escalier effect, the angular figuration of some splendid green and old rose tapestry. The air was as warm as in the Crimea with the same sweet fluffy smell of a certain flowering bush that I never could quite identify. I later caught whiffs of it in the gardens of the southern states. I'll just remark that there are three times right there. Uh, the, the time back in Russia, uh, the time in the United States, and the time uh, in uh, Cambridge. Uh, one almost doesn't notice what Nabokov is doing, bringing three times all together in one uh, image. The three arches of an Italianate bridge spanning the narrow stream combined to form, with the help of their almost perfect, almost unrippled replicas in the water, three lovely ovals. In its turn, the water cast a patch of lacy light on the stone of the entrados under which one's gliding craft passed. Now and then, shed by a blossoming tree, a petal would come down, 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 and with the odd feeling of seeing something neither worshiper nor casual spectator ought to see, one would manage to glimpse this reflection which swiftly, more swiftly than the petal fell, rose to meet it, and for the fraction of a second, one feared that the trick would not work, that the, blessed, that, that the blessed oil would not catch fire, that the reflection might miss and the petal float away alone. But every time the delicate union did take place with the magic precision of a poet's work meeting halfway his or a reader's recollection. If in the past I distrusted Nabokov and avoided speak memory, as I've said I did, it was because I thought quite naively, I believe now, that he rather excluded the reader from the tight little relationship between himself and his work. 
What I now think, and especially with that concluding phrase about a poet's work meeting halfway his or a reader's recollection, and notice this is not expectation, which one might well expect, <laughs> but recollection for the reader is made to realize the scene as if recollecting it out of his or her own experience, um, is that Nabokov presents himself as the superior magician who, whose tricks the observer is invited to follow just as far as possible, knowing all the while that Nabokov will be out ahead in awareness, but with an offer of the fullest opportunity, nevertheless, of a complete partnership in empathetic recollection and correlative creation according to the reader's capacities. But there is yet a third actor, a third near consciousness in this scene, in addition to the magic precision of a poet's work and a reader's recollection, and that is, in Nabokov's phrase, the innate harmonies of nature, harmonies in Wordsworth's phrase, of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they have to create and what perceive. Is not the autobiographer engaged in folding his recollections together with these innate harmonies, thereby discovering, creating a pattern of his narrative? And does not the reader bring another set of recollections to be fitted to this same emergent pattern that then imputes a meaning to the experience of both of them? Of all literary genres, it is an autobiography that the presence of the author can be most fully and directly experienced. For the autobiographer is there not in the content alone, though there are two, of course, for this is, after all, the story of a life, but also, and at least as importantly, in the style. Le style, the French say, c'est l'homme, ou la femme, one might add. Literary critics are fond of saying that one cannot separate form and content in any work, whatever the genre, and I think they are right to so insist, but what they say in regard of a poem or a novel is more self-evidently true when it comes to life writing. I imagine this is what Nabokov had in mind when he said, a writer's truest autobiography is the story of his style. For a supreme stylist like Nabokov, like Nabokov, how could this not be so? And when such a writer comes to write an actual autobiography, say in a book like Speak Memory, the story of his style will be there inevitably, inseparably, and simultaneously in the story of his life. I'm not sure what I would want to say to physicians about this issue, of style in life writing that would be of practical help to them, but surely tone and style must vary greatly in patients' self-presentations, and I should imagine a physician's responsive reading of a life story guided by an awareness of the particularities of style might play a significant role in treatment. Autobiography, according to the great German historiographer Wilhelm Diltai, is the highest and most instructive form in which the understanding of life confronts us. Here is the outward phenomenal course of a life which forms the basis for understanding what has produced it within a certain environment. The man who understands it is the same as the one who created it. A particular intimacy of understanding results from this. The person who seeks the connecting threads in the history of his life has already, from different points of view, created a coherence in that life which he is now putting into words. What I take Diltai to mean, if I, may if I may adopt my earlier terminology, is that in autobiography especially, you cannot separate form and content, style and substance, substance for, as the, for there is a single determining factor for both, and that is the person who both lives the life and in the autobiography understands it. In light of this, I cannot forbear recalling the Britannica definition the life of a man that happens to have been written by himself. So much for Diltai's particular intimacy of understanding. I remarked earlier that the principal, if not sole, resource of the autobiographer is memory, and that this is what makes life writing of crucial importance when thinking about narrative and its possible uses. There's a passage very near the end of Speak Memory in which Nabokov claims that everything he has done in the book is a result of his having listened attentively to memory and nothing else. He speaks of a garden that he, his wife, and their child visited in Saint Nazaire, the last in a series of such gardens or squares he encountered in his passage from Russia through France and England to the United States. And he says of it, laid out on the last limit of the past and on the verge of the present, it remains in my memory merely as a geometrical design, which no doubt I could fill easily in with the colors of plausible flowers if I were careless enough to break the hush of pure memory that, except perhaps with some chance tinnitus 
Due to the pressure of my own tired blood, I have left undisturbed and humbly listened to from the beginning. What I really remember about this neutrally blooming design is its clever thematic connection with transatlantic gardens and parks. This is surely what I pointed out earlier in Nabokov as what the supreme achievement of memory, which is the masterly use it makes of innate harmonies. But I want to question a little the claim that he humbly listened to the hush of pure memory from the beginning. The title of his book, Speak, Common, Comma, Memory, is intended, of course, to recall the classical invocation to the muse, speak muse, and through me tell the story of Odysseus and so on. But we should notice that the mood of Nabokov's verb is imperative, speak memory, which does not accord perfectly with humble listening and verbatim recording of what a factual or historical memory might say to him. And then there are the pages and pages of torturously written and rewritten, altered and revised manuscript one has seen reproduced that show what endless pains Nabokov took to get every word, every phrase, the rhythm of every sentence just right for what he was about. Surely memory doesn't speak like this with such finish, such elegance, such pregnancy to most of us. It would be a commonplace to observe that for the life writer, memory determines narrative. What is not so often noticed but is equally true is that narrative determines memory. Once a story begins to impose itself on events, the necessities of narrative reorder memory to their own ends. I want to glance at one more passage from Speak Memory, and this is the second of the two that I mentioned earlier, where memory seems to accede in a most remarkable way to the imperatives of narrative. It occurs at the end of the first chapter, and I'll remark parenthetically that Nabokov's most bravura effects come most often at chapter ends, and the narrator is recalling something that he says often happened when he was a child. His much-loved father, who was the aristocrat of the countryside, would be called out to hear a delegation of peasants, quote, with a plea for his mediation in some local feud or with some special subsidy or with the permission to harvest some bit of our land or cut down a coveted clump of trees. As soon as his father granted the request, Nabokov writes, he would be put through the national ordeal of being rocked and tossed up and securely caught by a score, a score or so of strong arms. Here's an account of the event from the boy's point of view, or rather, from the adult writer's point of view, assuming the boy's perspective. And this is the second passage. From my place at table, I would suddenly see through one of the west windows a marvelous case of levitation. There, for an instant, the figure of my father in his wind-rippled white summer suit would be displayed, gloriously sprawling in midair, his limbs in a curiously casual attitude, his handsome, imperturbable features turned to the sky. Thrice, this is all one sentence from this point on, thrice to the mighty heave-ho of his invisible tossers, he would fly up in this fashion, and the second time he would go higher than the first, and there the, then there he would be on his last and loftiest flight, reclining as if for good against the cobalt blue of the summer noon, like one of those paradisiac pers personages who comfortably soar with such a wealth of folds in their garments on the vaulted ceiling of a church, while below, one by one, the wax tapers in mortal hands light, light up to make a swarm of minute flames in the midst of incense, and the priest chants of eternal repose and funeral lilies conceal the face of whoever lies there among the swimming lights in the open coffin. There's a gradual progression in that beautifully modulated final sentence from the temporal mode of memory to the non-temporal mode of art, and the story the passage unfolds implies a human narrative of the vastest proportions for who, we must ask, lies in that coffin. It is Nabokov's father, certainly, whose death looms just out of sight throughout the book, but it is also certainly Nabokov himself, and equally certainly the reader. In the end, it must be anyone and everyone. Thus, the significance of a narrative procedure that no doubt depends on memory, but that also transforms memory and reorders it to its own quite other ends. What I am suggesting is that narrative is one way, and for the life writer, perhaps the chief way to embody meaning, and I mean quite literally, to give body to. When one considers the ways of narrative medicine, it is important to recognize that the body too has its narrative and is possessed of its own memories. 
There's a fascinating passage in John Battista Vico's New Science where he describes the earliest stage in the cyclical history of humankind when language was at its most poetic and imaginative pitch. The peoples of the heroic age, according to Vico, quote, who were almost all body and almost no reflection, must have been all vivid sensation in perceiving particulars, strong imagination in apprehending and enlarging them, sharp wit in refining them to their imaginative genera, and robust memory in retaining them. It is true that these faculties appertain to the mind, but they have their roots in the body and draw their strength from it. Hence, memory is the same as imagination. It's not altogether clear to me how that hint of the final sentence logically binds the statement that follows with what has gone before, but Vico says two things of great significance here in his characteristic gnomic way. One, that memory is the same as imagination, and the other, that the human faculties of vivid sensation, strong imagination, sharp wit, and robust memory were all in the body before they were in the mind, and I would add as corollary that they continue in the body in an unconscious state even after mind has appropriated them to itself. The best, best explication of all this that I'm familiar with comes in Oliver Sacks' little book, A Leg to Stand On, in which he describes an accident that resulted in a mangled left leg. The damage, however, as Sacks presents it, was not restricted to the physical leg alone, but affected his body's memory of motion, of rhythmic movement, of walking, indeed, its memory of itself. He had to learn to walk again, and he could do that only by an unconscious uh, remembering. The moment came, according to Sachs, after all his attempts at thinking out movement, put this foot forward, now that one, and so on, when some favorite music of Mendelssohn suddenly came to him, and in response, his temporally traumatized and forgotten bodily rhythms returned, and he could walk as he always had, naturally and without thought. It was as if I suddenly remembered how to walk, he writes. Indeed, not as if I remembered how to walk. All of a sudden, I remembered walking's natural, unconscious rhythm, rhythm and melody. It came to me suddenly, like remembering a once familiar but long forgotten tune. We get another rather different but very compelling instance of memory embodied, this time in a painting and a poem in Elizabeth Bishop's great poem that she names simply Poem. And that's the other, the other work in the handout. This is the work, this is the work that is also the source of my title, Life and the Memory of It. In describing the tiny painting done by her great uncle, Bishop, I would suggest, is presenting her view of the relationship that any work of art, whether a painting or a poem, but especially an autobiography, bears to the life of the artist and to the life of the viewer or reader. It may be that everyone here is thoroughly familiar with poem, and as one line of the piece puts it, has looked at it long enough to memorize it. But I hope you'll indulge me anyway and allow me to read the poem before talking about its pertinence in thinking about narrative medicine. Perhaps I might say before reading poem that Bishop was a great lover of the poetry of Jared Manley Hopkins, especially admiring, as she put it in an early essay, the way his work attempted to, quote, portray not a thought, but a mind thinking. One sees the same attempt in poem in all the parenthetical asides, the exclamations, the self-queries, the revisions that show a mind in motion rather than one reflecting back after the thought. Excuse me. This is poem. And there are interesting reasons I think that one could speculate about, but I won't and go off the track now to do it, why she calls it poem. Uh, there are very few poems that are just called poem, although Elizabeth Bishop called her very last work uh, sonnet. Um, interesting reasons for that, too. So this is poem. About the size of an old-style dollar bill, American or Canadian, mostly the same whites, gray greens, and steel grays. This little painting, a sketch for a larger one, has never earned any money in its life. Useless and free, it has spent 70 years as a minor family relic, handing, handed, down, handed along collaterally to owners who looked at it sometimes or didn't bother to. It must be Nova Scotia. Only there does one see gabled wooden houses 
painted in that awful shade of brown. The other houses, the bits that show are white, elm trees, low hills, the thin church steeple, that gray-blue wisp, or is it? In the foreground, a water meadow with some tiny cows, two brush strokes each, but confidently cows, two minuscule white geese in the blue water, back to back, feeding, and a slanting stick. Up closer, a wild iris, white and yellow. I only noticed in about the hundredth reading of those lines uh, that the slanting stick, when seen from a distance, or rather when seen closer up, is the wild iris. Uh, but she doesn't see that at first, and then she corrects herself. Uh, and a slanting stick, up closer, a wild iris, white and yellow, fresh squiggled from the tube. The air is cold, is fresh and cold, cold early spring, clear as gray glass. A half inch of blue sky below the steel gray storm clouds. They were the artist's specialty. A speck-like bird is flying to the left. Or is it a fly speck looking like a bird? <laughs> Heavens, I recognize the place. I know it. It's behind. I can almost remember the farmer's name. His barn backed on that meadow. There it is. Titanium white, one dab. The hint of steeple. Filaments of brush hair is barely there. Must be the Presbyterian church. Would that be Miss Gillespie's house? Those particular geese and cows are naturally before my time. A sketch done in an hour, in one breath, once taken from the trunk and handed over. Would you like this? I'll probably never have room to hang these things again. Your Uncle George, no, mine. My Uncle George, he'd be your great uncle. Left them all with mother when he went back to England. You know, he was quite famous, an RA. I never knew him. We both knew this place, apparently, this literal small backwater. Looked at it long enough to memorize it, our years apart. How strange. And it's still loved, or its memory is. It must have changed a lot. Our visions coincided. Visions is too serious a word. Our looks, two looks. Art copying from life and life itself. Life and the memory of it so compressed they've turned into each other. Which is which? Life and the memory of it cramped, dim on a piece of Bristol board. Dim, but how live, how touching in detail. The little that we get for free, the little of our earthly trust, not much. About the size of our abidance, along with theirs, the munching cows, the iris, crisp and shivering, the water still standing from spring freshets, the yet to be dismantled elms, the geese, in the opening stanza, Bishop fixes on three aspects of Great Uncle George's painting that will become the ruling motifs of the poem. Its miniature size, its uselessness in the world of commerce, and its continuance, its abidance, one might say, for a cons considerable time in spite of neglect. About the size of an old style dollar bill, Bishop says, and then with a nod to her own biography, having the effect of bringing her life and her art into play alongside Great Uncle George's American or Canadian, either or both, as Bishop was either or both throughout a life that was virtually homeless in spite of a constant search for some place that would feel like home. The image of an old style dollar bill, which would have had small value in its own time and has even less now, is perfect for Bishop's purposes. It has never earned any money in its life, and in the world of getting and spending is useless and free, yet it has spent and the verb is surely carefully chosen. It has spent 70 years, three score years and 10, one might say a lifetime, as what it has been and continues to be in the midst of this family whose members have had just enough time to grow up, grow old, and die. Bishop's quiet and incidental manner can occasionally cause readers to overlook important effects in her poetry, I think, as in the present instance where one could hardly fail to be aware that the poem is about place, but might well not see that it is at least as much concerned with time. From the old style dollar bill to the 70 years of the painting's lifetime to the owners who looked at it sometimes or didn't bother to. This sets the stage for the very close look that Bishop gives to the painting, a living into it really, and a kind of imaginative reconstruction of how the painting was done, which I take to be a deliberate analog to how a poem gets written, accompanied by Bishop's characteristic second thoughts and self-questionings. A thin church steeple, that gray-blue wisp, or is it? Some tiny cows, two brush, brush strokes each, but confidently cows. 
a wild iris, white, white and yellow, fresh squiggled from the tube. Then suddenly we're inside the painting. The air is fresh and cold, cold early spring. Or rather, we are for, mo for a moment inside, then quickly outside and years away. The steel gray storm clouds, they were the artist's specialty. And finally, we are left to contemplate the question of what we are looking at, wh whether what we are looking at is art copying nature, a speck-like bird is flying in to the left, or whether it is nature making itself a part of the work of art, or is it a fly speck looking like a bird? Then comes the recognition expressed in a characteristically homely expression, heavens, I recognize the place, I know it. The farmer in his barn, titanium white, one dab, the meadow, they're all there, both in the painting and in Bishop's memory, which goes exactly halfway to meet great, great Uncle George's memory embodied in this little painting. For the painter, as Alberto Giacometti once said, always paints not from nature, but from a memory of nature. And now that she remembers and recognizes the scene, Bishop finds the answer to her earlier question. Yes, that gray-blue wisp does represent a church steeple, for though it is barely there in the painting, only a hint of steeple, filaments of brush hairs, Bishop, Bishop's memory tells her that this must be the Presbyterian church. That other dab, half, away, half an inch away, would be Miss Gillespie's house. Interestingly enough, Bishop told her Aunt Grace, who passed the painting on to Elizabeth Bishop, uh, that she just made up Miss Gillespie because it's a good Scotch name and went well with geese. <laughs> and though these, those particular geese and cows are naturally before my time, nevertheless, there they are now, apparently immune to the passage of time, two minuscule white geese in the blue water, back-to-back -back feeding, and some tiny cows, two brush strokes each, but confidently cows. Art is long, life is short, we say, and there it is now, a sketch done in an hour, in one breath, once taken from a trunk and handed over, the same as, as it has been for 70 years, untouched by the passage of time, unless that speck-like bird is indeed a fly speck, looking like a bird. There follows the crucial final verse paragraph in which Bishop outlines that three-cornered relationship between the artist, the work of art, and the viewer or reader that I've analyzed earlier, only further complicated here by the inter-entanglement of life and the memory of it. What I hope to demonstrate is that in this last section of poem, Bishop offers us not only a sense of the embodying powers of art, whether that art be painting or poetry, but also what I might term a hermeneutics of the autobiographical act, that is, how autobiography means and how it is to be interpreted. I never knew him, she says, and this, after all, is the usual situation when we look at a painting or, for that matter, read a poem or an autobiography. On the other hand, we both knew this place, looked at it long enough to memorize it our years apart. This is the ground on which their lives and their minds can meet, for they have both taken the scene into memory so fully that it has become a part of themselves. How great, St. Augustine exclaims in Book 10 of the Confessions, is this force of memory, how exceedingly great. It is I myself who remember, I, the mind. Without memory, Augustine says, I should not be able to call myself, myself. Memory, too, like the work of art, affects a continuity or an abidance across time, which I take it is the significance of bishops correcting herself in the next line, and it's still loved, or its memory is, it must have changed a lot. Of course, it has changed a lot, for life goes on with its incessant changes, leaving only memory and the work of art capable of staying the moment and investing with a fullness of meaning. In this tiny painting, as in poem itself, our looks, our two looks coincide, and art copying from life and life itself intermingle to that degree that they cannot be told apart. Life and the memory of it so compressed, they've turned into each other. Here it is that Bishop finds words that better than almost any others I can think of serve to realize what I take to be the significance and essential character of autobiography. Life and the memory of it cramped, dim in a piece of Bristol board, for our purposes, it seems fair to transform Bishop's phrasing slightly and refer to life and the memory of it compressed into an expressive narrative and the images and rhythms of an autobiography. I think of a passage in George Gusdorf's seminal essay on autobiography where he describes a painting practice he takes to be analogous to the composition of an autobiography. Any autobiography, he writes, is a moment of the life that it recounts 
is struggles to draw the meaning from the, that life, but it is itself a meaning in the life. One part of the whole claims to reflect the whole, but it adds something to this whole of which it constitutes a moment. Some Flemish or Dutch painters, and I, I think that Gusdorf has principally in mind uh, Jan van Eyck and the Arnold uh, wedding portrait. Uh, some Flemish or Dutch painters of interior scenes depict a little mirror on the wall in which the painting is repeated a second time. The image in the mirror not only duplicates the scene, but adds to it as a new dimension, a distancing perspective. Likewise, autobiography is not a simple recapitulation of the past, but is, in addition, an interpretation of the past, achieved from the standpoint and according to the needs of the present. The significance of autobiography, Gusdorf goes, goes on to say, should therefore be sought beyond truth and falsity, as those are conceived by simple common sense. It is unquestionably a document about a life, and the historian has a perfect right to check out its testimony and verify its accuracy, but it is also a work of art, and therefore, we might add, capable of providing the sensitive and responsive reader the same possibility of self-understanding achieved through the complex web of text understanding and understanding of another life woven into that text that any novel or poem, or one might add, painting could offer. It is dim, Bishop repeats, but how live, how touching in detail, the little that we get for free, the little of our earthly trust, not much. To the great world of commerce, it certainly will seem insignificant, this Jamesian state of heightened awareness, and the truth is not much, but on the other hand, it's everything. We recall that the little painting has never earned any money in its life, that it's useless and free, a minor family relic, that's all, but how live, how touching in detail, and it's for free. What does it come to? Not much, about the size of our abidance, that is to say, about the size of an old style dollar bill, American or Canadian. Abidance is a great work, one that I don't recall ever encountering elsewhere, and would be very loath to do without here. It is also very much a bishop word, plain and unassuming, so I know that if I were to suggest, as I now do, that it might be translated as continuance, which in turn could be understood to refer to a state of consciousness or awareness that is of the moment, but also forever, she would protest as she does of visions that is too serious, too serious a word, too serious a claim. Nevertheless, that is the size of our abidance and theirs, the munching cows, the iris crisp and shivering, the water still standing from spring freshets. There they are, unchanged and unchanging, cramped, dim on a piece of Bristol board, dim, but how live, how touching in detail. Thus the work of art, painting or work, work of art, painting or poem, that rescues all beauty from the ravages of time. But then there is the final line that acknowledges that time will start up again, and with the change of seasons will dismantle the elms and all else, the yet to be dismantled elms, the geese. It is very interesting to know that according to one commentator, Bishop worked and reworked this concluding line to preserve the elms from time. In draft after draft, Anne Caldwell writes, she struggles to keep the elms whole. In the first draft she wrote, the elms never dismantled. In later ones, four undismantled elms, the never to be dismantled new, now elms, and then the never to be dismantled elms. Finally, she crossed out never and wrote over it yet. This brings us back to the realism of the little that we get for free. Not much, not much, but everything all the same. What I find in Elizabeth Bishop's poem is an extended meditation on a phrase that perfectly embodies the nature and the significance of life writing, as if she were thinking about the nature of autobiography at the same time that she gives us a brilliantly comp compressed version of one. Life and the memory of it, cramped, dim, on a piece of Bristol board. I imagine that many readers coming upon the phrase would react as I do, in imitation of Bishop looking at the painting, with memories of their own that they find exactly answerable to the memories stirred in Bishop herself. It is a mere coincidence that there was a Miss Gillespie in my hometown, Irene Gillespie was her name, but the memories of poet and reader conjoined in the poem go much deeper than the coincidental. Is it not the same as with Nabokov's pedal falling into the cam and meeting its own image rising up in the river? One feared that the reflection might miss and the petal float away alone, but every time the delicate union did take place with the magic precision of a poet's word meeting halfway his or a reader's recollection. 
This version of the poet, poem, reader, troika, or the author, autobiography, reader one, might serve as an ideal literary model for the patient-physician relationship, which has its own third term, not in a single text, but in two life stories, joining and mutually interpreting one another. This may be a model more ideal than realizable, but it seems to me at least implicit in what I know of the philosophy of narrative medicine. James Olney's characteristically rich and suggestive paper is itself, in a number of measures, also a pointed summary of his magisterial study, Memory and Narrative. In these perforce elliptical comments, I want to take up a few of his remarks about autobiographical narrative and then make a very brief reference to their bearing on narrative medicine. He gets immediately to the point. Autobiography, or life writing, as he says, is an undertaking to, quote, half discover, half create that story, unique to each individual, and to tell it to some portion of the world in an effort to find a meaning for it all. He is, from the outset, aware that this is not an analytic, or a priori proposition, a self-explanatory, self-unfolding definition. And so he proceeds at once to surround it with an embedded <laughs> So he proceeds at once <laughs> to surround it with an embedded in a cycle of related terms that are intended both to suggest and unpack this provisional offering. Such profoundly narrative behavior, he goes on, quote, offers itself for and demands interpretation. He is referring here obliquely, I surmise, both to Nietzsche's stop you dead in your tracks epigram, there are no facts, there are only interpretations, <coughs> and in a more general sense to that grand panjandrum of interpretation, Freud. Its chief resource, he tells us, is, me is memory. And when it is composed and transmitted, it is a profoundly, quote, literary act, suggesting here that it possesses distinct formal properties, but playing as well with a subtextual pun that it is also a performance, a staged or sta a stage or staged piece or composition, a behavioral artifact. It is also in a number of senses, quote, unfinished, referring to the life represented in autobiographical narrative, but not necessarily to the narrative representation itself. The motive for this constructive and memorial behavior is to discover and or create, quote, a meaning for the experiences of a life. What does it mean to have lived this life is always and ever the autobiograph autobiographer's essential question. What does it mean to have lived this life? I can only step up to this question by asking in turn, what does this sentence mean? <laughs> and Professor only signals to us typographically that he's aware that there's a problem uh, uh, here. You, you don't have the typography in, in front of you, so let me describe it uh, uh, for you. 
uh, 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 he says it's an effort to discover, create, quote, a meaning for the experiences of life, of a life. Meaning, in that first sentence I've just quoted, is in bold italics, and then in quotations, what does it mean to have lived this life? In quotation marks, and in italics. Uh, something's happening there. Uh, and this is the, as ever, the autobiograph autobiographer's essential question. What does it mean to have lived this life? And as I said, I can only say in response to this sentence, as I step up to it, what does this sentence mean? I am reminded in this connection of the story about the old Jewish man, one of Job's legion of great-great-grandsons, who having lived a blameless and holy life was afflicted with numerous severe sufferings. In his bereft and woeful, st woeful state, he seeks to inquire of the deity. And the Lord, after an appropriate pause, replies, look who's asking. <laughs> Indeed, under the stress that induces this definitional gesture, and the further stress that it itself in its turn induces, Professor Olney makes reference to, quote, the autobiographer's essential question. Now, James Olney is a well-known certified modernist and postmodernist, whose subscription to the articles of non-essentiality and undecidability are not in any case to be doubted. <laughs> uh, Matthew Arnold had once famously asserted that, quote, at bottom, poetry is a criticism of life. T.S. Eliot, to whom Arnold was a continuous source of annoyance, <laughs> snappishly responded that Arnold had apparently forgotten that, quote, the bottom is a long way down. <laughs> and James only tries to logically maneuver his way out of this impasse by bringing forward the other side or face of this dialogical drama to the reader or respond of or responded to autobiographical narrative who, quote, commits in a collaborative gesture to this same pursuit of meaning at first, the meaning of the autobiographer's experience, but then, by the mysterious ways of art, the meaning of the reader's own experience. It is, it is with no censorious intention that I note a fissure opening up in the densely impacted terrain of James Olney's argument. He has got to throw a bridge across or circumambulate around the abyss that the incremental increase of pressure that has been brought to bear by the unmodified repetition of the word and the idea of, quote, meaning. Hence, quote, the mysterious ways of art. Remember, he, that's a phrase he uses. The mysterious words work, the mysterious ways of art functions as a kind of black box or thaumaturgical transducer in the course of that exposition it serves as a filler or non-explanatory non phrase of explanation in the navigation of an extremely difficult argument. How vulnerable, blunted, or impaired the impetus of this connection has locally become is indicated by Professor Olney's hasty or casual reference to quote, the meaning of the reader's own experience a clause in which he uncharacteristically overlooks the multiple possible references to the reader's experience of his own life, to his experience of both reading and reading this particular autobiographical text, and to an indefinite array of different combinations of the major variables. What we come out with, along with Professor Olney at this point, is that in no sense are we dealing with what he refers to rather scornfully as, quote, raw experience. In strict terms, there is no such thing as raw experience. Everything that comes to us is mediated. Everything that is given to us comes from a medium. Everything that we get is gotten by us through a medium. Our mental presentations are mediated by our bodies, 
Our bodily experiences are made and presented to us in large measure by means of the refracting and, and refractive medium of our conscious minds, as well as by parts of the mind that are not conscious. Professor Olney is indeed a swimmer in deep waters. He has immersed himself in the destructive element and crawls along cheerfully in freestyle. <laughs> While I confess I can do no more than tread water. How, how freely he moves, how freely he moves is demonstrated next by his turning to hermeneutics and by his return to its origin in the exegetical reading of the Bible. It should be noted that the term itself comes into English only in the middle of the 18th century. That is to say, it makes its appearance here only after the authority of the scriptural narratives has begun to be challenged. And its evolved, and its evolved principles of interpretation remain themselves only mildly disguised, secularized forms of religious paradoxes, forms that themselves arise out of the contemplation of the contradictions and conundrums that are entailed in our efforts to understand systematically the whole of human experience. All cultures create realms that they hold to be sacred. These realms are regularly described or represented in narratives. Sacred stories about creation, about gods and demons and devils, the Odysseys about the plight in which we, humanity, find ourselves, projections of our ultimate destinies or ends. In Western culture, the story of the individual self or soul or life on its mortal pilgrimage through this world and on its way to God came to figure and indeed increasingly to be one of the central sacred narratives of creation, trial, fall, punishment, exile, penance, illumination, conversion, and salvation. And the story of that life and self was also the story of all humanity, of the human race. Everything in it had meaning because everything fitted into a grand design and a harmonious scheme which had the beautifully simple and limitlessly complex structure of a narrative account. In the course of the modern evolution of Western culture, the sacred realm and the sacred stories began to lose their power of transcendence, of absolute truth and credibility, of individual certitude and of coherence, sense, and finality. And when James only cites a passage from Diltai, he brings forward the evidence of the transfiguration that was entailed. Autobiography, Diltai writes, quote, is the highest and most instructive form in which the understanding of life confronts us. Here is the outward phenomenal course of a life which forms the basis for understanding what has produced it within a certain environment. The man who understands it is the one who created it. Here we see the transformation of the entire structure of meaning, in quotation the great historiographer Diltai in declaring that, quote, here is the outward phenomenal course of life, of a life, which forms the basis for understanding what has produced it within a certain environment, is in effect stating that meaning is to be found and disclosed through the understanding of causality, understanding that has, quote, that has produced it within a certain environment. And causality brings intractably in its train, rationality. To be sure, the rationality in question is historical, genetic, and quasi-Hegelian rationality, and not the formal propositional rationality of Aristotle. But it is nonetheless causal and rational, rather than supernatural, transcendent, and magical. And in the, quote, connecting threads and, quote, coherence that Diltai goes on to refer to we can see the transmigration of soul, with a capital S, to self, with a small s. Or to revert to the terms of our current and immediate frame of reference from meaning, with a capital M, to meaning, 
with M in the lower case. Our problem is that we are all hung up between these two spellings or ideas of meaning. We shift half consciously from one to the other and tend to take advantage of the intellectual slippage that allows us to feel as if we were talking about meaning, capital M, when we are discussing nothing more than meaning, small m. Nothing more? Isn't that enough to go on with? <laughs> we all do it. We are all complicit in it. The temptation is too much for us. Professor only does it much less than almost all of us. <laughs> and does not succumb at all to this amiable weakness when he deals with his great modernist figures of Kafka, Beckett, and Giacometti. All three of these are more enormous creative powers were fearless in their confrontation of a world and a human life in which meaning in capitals had been utterly withdrawn, had been wholly evacuated, and James only himself is unwaveringly loyal to their bleak powerful visions. Which brings me, at the very end, to narrative medicine. Medicine proposes to us a thoroughly naturalized world. There is no real room in it for capital letters or big words. In the face of final loneliness and mortality, it has little to offer by way of consolation, much less of explanation. One of the things it can offer, however, is the sense of solidarity. The sense that we, all of us, are destined to the same implacable narrative fate. And that like it or not, fearful or not, we must all go through the end of the story one by one. I can do no better than refer to one of James's favorite passages. It, it, he cites it again and again. It comes at the very end of Beckett's great novel, The Unnameable. I don't know, that's all words. Never wake, all words. There's nothing else. You must go on, that's all I know. They're going to stop. I know that well, I can feel it. They're going to abandon me. It will be the silence. It will be I. You must go on. I can't go on. You must go on. I'll go on. You must say words as long as there are any, until they find me, until they say me. You must go on. Perhaps it's done already. Perhaps they have said me already. Perhaps they have carried me to the threshold of my story, before the door that opens on my story. That would surprise me. If it opens, it will be I. It will be the silence. Where I am, I don't know. I'll never know. In the silence, you don't know. You must go on. I can't go on. I'll go on. Can I say something very briefly? Um, <laughs> I came uh, this afternoon fully expecting to be humbled by uh, Stephen Marcus, and I've not been disappointed. I've been, <laughs> been thoroughly humbled, and the reason I came with that expectation is that I have seen on countless occasions uh, in summer institutes, in uh, sitting on selection committees at the National Humanities Center, where all the rest of us were getting into tangles complete tangles of thought and tangles of language and uh, tangles of what we wanted to do. And suddenly Stephen would come with a scalpel and he would cut <laughs> right through the whole thing and he would humble us all. And he's done it again today, brilliantly. Before we begin the discussion, we have inevitably fallen about an hour behind. So what we thought was that we would talk for about 15 minutes and then take a shorter break, maybe about 15 minutes, and then continue until close to five. Hope that works for everyone. So um, 
ready to take questions. They're ready to take questions. <laughs> or comments. Yes. I'm not terribly clear on the nexus that you're pointing to, but um, I can imagine, uh, in fact, that there could be deep lessons to be learned even from autobiography that doesn't aspire to and doesn't come close to being uh, a work of art. Um, that there still could be, in some sense, um, a possibility of our living into an experience that is not our experience, but that becomes somehow uh, through our empathetic response becomes our experience. Um, but it is so much more powerful when you're talking about an autobiography like uh, Nabokov's or any number of autobiographies where the uh, person who produces the autobiography is also a, a very self-conscious artist. Uh, Virginia Woolf, for example. Um, through one, in the, in the course of reading Virginia Woolf's sketch of the past, one becomes, in effect, Virginia Woolf. Um, and uh, Stephen uh, alluded to my expression, the mysteries of art, uh, but that's the only thing I can think to call it, uh, is the way in which we are brought into that experience that is not our experience, and suddenly it becomes our experience. Or at the end of poem, Elizabeth Bishop's poem, uh, when uh, I feel that she is, she is writing my experience, uh, just as she feels this painting is something that's produced out of her own memory. Um, she's writing my experience, and I begin to think, I begin to remember this and this and this, uh, which is what is being remembered in the poem. What you just said is better than mysterious ways of art. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm not an English professor, but I, I was wondering if I could direct you to another triangle. And the triangle would be uh, the Bakov, the writer, speak memory, and then that other subversive piece of work, Cal Fire. <laughs> talking about speak memory and giving a certain creative credence to the life of the writer, the narrator. This is also created by the same man who wrote perhaps the quintessential novel about the, the narrator as someone we can't trust. Mm -hmm. And what that might imply for us listening to the stories of those who come to us, you know, repeating their life, whether it be in a clinical context or perhaps in a teaching context. Well, that's a very interesting question for me, uh, especially with regard to Nabokov, uh, because as I say I did distrust Nabokov for a long time. Uh, and now I, now I come to think that Speak Memory is his greatest work of art. For me, a greater work of art than Pale Fire, for example, or Lolita, or uh, any of the other novels. Um, and precisely uh, because he somehow has transformed his own life into a work of art in a way that he doesn't do uh, in Speak Memory. I'm uh, sorry, sorry, in, in Pale Fire. Um, I mean, when he, in the last chapter, when he uh, describes the birth of uh, their son, uh, I take him to be speaking, although he does it with characteristic uh, brilliance, uh, with uh, all the um, rhetorical tools that he can bring to bear, yet I take him to be speaking very, very sincerely about what this birth of the child meant to him. Uh, and somehow, when he brings his own life this directly into it, it means infinitely more to me and then when he does, I admire everything in Pale Fire, but I find myself admiring without um, feeling this greatness that uh, the, uh, his real and his own life uh, brings to it. What's the criterion that speaks to you that way? Oh, uh, I don't know what the criterion is. Uh, it's what comes from myself in response to it, I think.
That's very difficult. Um, very interesting, too. I think that, that for Nabokov, uh, and I, I would point out uh, when Stephen talked about meaning with a capital M and meaning with a, a small m, although I did a lot of um, different typographical things in the paper, as Stephen has already pointed out, I don't think that I ever capitalized meaning. I don't think I did. Um, and uh, then I would go on to Nabokov and say that I think uh, uh, Nabokov is very close to saying that style is meaning. Style is meaning for him. Uh, it's, it's the uh, achievement of something stylistic that would cause him to think of meaning. And then I think about, to go on to the question of death, um, Nabokov deeply, deeply feared death. I mean, he talks about it all the time, how much he feared it because it was loss of consciousness. It was loss of this awareness that he found it possible to express in language, and that was the highest good for him, I think, in a way. Um, he talks about the uh, idiocy, idiocy of somebody um, who can just nod off, who can go to sleep without any concern at all. Uh, he says, this, this, is, this is like dying. What's, what's the matter? He says, this is comparable to sitting and uh, chatting to somebody who's defecating. Uh, you don't think there's anything wrong with that? Uh, he said, anybody who can nod off in a, in a train uh, is you know, committing a small death. Uh, I mean, he just, this, this idea that consciousness and awareness are everything um, was so powerful with him. Very quickly, I'll, I'll say um, uh, I think the, uh, the citation of May Sarton is very interesting because I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that she went back and rewrote the diaries before she published them. Uh, and that, make, that makes a great deal of difference uh, because you uh, perceive uh, or fail to perceive certain things in, from one perspective, that say, as you're living them, which you can see then from a year or two years or ten years later. Um, but uh, diaries are caught in that, in that sort of bind. Uh, they don't have the perspective to uh, discover uh, the meaning at the pre present moment. You, you, you can't see the forest for the trees. Uh, let, let me uh, just say, that I, uh, by the way, I think that, uh, uh, that all forms of writing of this kind, uh, or, or perhaps even all forms of writing, uh, are written with the idea of a reader in mind. That is, you can't write without projecting a reader uh, uh, somewhere, somehow, uh, too. So that although you might not be writing for publication, let's say, like Pete's was not writing, but you're writing to be read by someone. This person may be anonymous, unknown. You don't have a clear image, but it's certainly meant to be seen and perused and thought about by somebody else, even if it's a, a daily journal. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, I, I, it's impossible not to, to, to read Anne, Fr the, the, the Anne Frank's diary without being aware of how powerfully she imagines a reader. Yeah. Yes. I was going to make the to this um, by the two recent presenters as well. Um, um, there are those literary theorists and also those philosophers and theologians who claim that in fact um, that our reality is a matter of narrative. That is to say what we value, what we do, our morality is all based <laughs> upon stories. Um, and if this is the case then our experience <laughs> comes from narrative. And I'm specifically referring to people like uh, Michael Novak, like, um, like Richard Slotkin, um, uh, Barbara Sproul, um, and others. Well, I think uh, James referred to, to it. I think he, he uh, 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 paraphrases someone, uh, uh, 
doesn't name him, uh, or there are a number, who believe that the structure of experience is itself naturally narrative. I mean, that's a, that's a deep question. Well, it's a very deep question, but uh, th that, in effect, is to say that God is responsible for the, for the narrat narratives we live. Uh, and that seemed to me a, a hopeless tack for me to take uh, in the paper today. Uh, but th that's why I said that one theologically inclined observer has said this. Um, but I don't, I can't think that the narrative that is discovered to go into an autobiography is simply handed to us by God. Even St. Augustine knows better than that. Or perhaps especially St. Augustine. There's an interesting thing about Augustine's confession, that famous scene in which he, uh, he's converted at the moment that he hears a children's rhyme, pick up and read, pick up and read, tole et lege. Um, there is one uh, French scholar who said, I mean a deep, deep scholar of uh, St. Augustine, who talks about all the other autobiographical accounts that St. Augustine gave in his life at different uh, times, on different occasions, for different purposes. He said this is the only time in which he mentioned that the children's saying totally at lege. Now, St. Augustine, I'm not saying that St. Augustine falsified things for rhetorical purposes, but he knew how powerful that was all the same. Uh, and, and centuries of readers have discovered how powerful it is too. Um, there's, the, uh, a way in which uh, we are necessarily uh, the creators of the narratives. And then we bring them back to experience. We only have time for one more. Yes. Uh, Lyle Brody. I have a question I'm actually a bit scared of asking in a way. Um, I was listening to a reporter on, on NPR uh, in, interviewing um, an antiquities expert following the sack of the museum in Baghdad, and he was talking about this huge loss for humanity. And then the inevitable question at the end came, why should we worry about artifacts when uh, more that, when, you know, does it, you know, that means we're not worrying about human beings? And I'm, I'm nervous even to, raise, to repeat that question because it seems to me just a repetition of, of, of more barbarity in a sense. But, um, and I have, but I, I've still been troubled again, you know, just be, I've been mulling over that, that conversation. And it, it seems to me that the, the question, it, it, there is a deep question about what is the value of art in terms of, of, of human life, as, as can one actually make a distinction between human life and, and representations of human life? And um, so I sort of want, in a sense, to repeat that question and, and wonder if, if, if um, <coughs> Do you have anything anything to say about about that that question? I'm going to answer that question. Uh, well, well I, I, I guess I could begin and end uh, by saying there is no culture known to me which does not make representations of human life, uh, either in the prehistoric past or in the, in, in the present. So one has to say why is this universal? What does it mean that it's universal? It may mean X, Y, or Z, but certainly it's the, the question, one of the places where we might, where we might begin. Uh, since it occurs everywhere, you know, in all, all cultures that we, uh, we know of, uh, one has at least the basis for a number of hypothetic hy hypotheses about it. It's a, a profoundly human act. Profoundly human act. And, uh, in terms of autobiography, I think it's a profoundly human act of to want to tell your story, want to have it known. Um, and uh, narrative, I think, is a profoundly human act. Uh, it occurs uh, with, all, with all human beings, telling a story. So I, I mean, I, I, I don't really see um, any kind of terrible split, any kind of inhumanity uh, in talking about the value of uh, antiquities or in talking about uh, the value of art or in talking about uh, it just seems to me so profoundly hu human. Okay, we'll reconvene in about 15 minutes, all right? Thank you so much. <laughs>